day everyone so today our group will discuss about classical christian tradition here in general introduction the main purpose of this is to present the principal ideas and issues in the area of ethics offered by philosophers from classical to contemporary times the third book in a three-volume series devoted to basic subject matters of philosophy. The first two volumes dealt respectively with the philosophy of man and metaphysics. In metaphysics, certain fundamental themes relevant to all aspects of philosophic enterprise were discussed. These themes centered on the basic question of what it is to be or to exist. Involved in being were such realities as casualty, change, and contingency, and the foundation of being was seen to be the existence of God. While in philosophy of man, the volume treated such central issues of, for man as the question of his unity in being, his spiritual nature, his destiny, and the character of his knowledge. These two philosophical sciences are called speculative branches of philosophy because their main trust is to is toward finding true and satisfactory answer to the questions they raise. In speculative science, in metaphysics, the question is what is it, what is it to be? While in philosophy, philosophy of man, what is it to be a man? Although, although the conclusion of the speculative science will have an indirect effect on the conduct of man, they do not immediately set themselves to determine what being should be or what man should be. In this case of ethics, however, there is a practical emphasis for this ethics is a non-speculative science. Non-speculative science seek normative principles of conduct ethics of course preposes some principles from metaphysics and some notion of man's nature from the philosophy of man but it is mainly concerned with what man should do with what his action or conduct as a man should be more express more fully expressed Ethics is that practical philosophical study that seeks to find some principle of order for those human actions for which we free, we freely responsible and over which we have rational rational control. Such deliberate actions are opposed to countless other acts of man digestion, respiration, the activity of the nervous system that are own action but are controlled automatically and without need for any choice or direction on our part. On the approaches to morality, the moral philosopher is concerned with human acts, with those actions in which we are free and responsible, but he is not alone in this concern. The psychiatrist, the theology, theologian, and the psychologist have its own way of interest and deliberate, deliberative, deliberative and free human action. The moral philosopher di differs from each of them in the point of view of which that uniquely his. In psychiatrists, the moral philosopher is not concerned with the analysis of the subconscious motivation of any one in any one individual or the exposition of the emotion and feelings that accompany the action of individuals in their lives. 
while in while in the theologian it uses the content of really really vision as a source of his normative morality while in psychologists it is interested in the measurement and analysis of the emotion and complex that an individual may have he is not concerned with establishing a systematic structure of the way men ought to act this latter concern discovering by reason how men ought to act identifies the identifies the precise viewpoint of moralists John Locke John Locke is a famous English philosopher who once observed that men ought creatively long before Aristotle wrote his logical treatises on how to think. The same observation can be made out about ethics. There were morals long before there was any science of morality. The student brings to his formal study of ethics his experience of having made and continuing to make moral decisions. The very fact of being human gives him practical practice in the area of ethics, but the advantage of continuing experience of moral decision is not enough. Moral decision require analysis on the philosophical level. Every man wants to feel some rational consistency in the kinds of deliberate action he experiences. He is not content to choose to act without reflection. He wants he wants to see whether such choices are warranted to perhaps are the best moral choices he could make. The philosophers presented in this book have furnished explicit analysis of these moral choices. In keeping with the plan of this series, this analysis reflects a pluralistic approach to morality. However, even with the differences that do exist, certain similarities appear in the key position considered in each, in each section of the book. Let us then address ourselves to these key issues. I am Mary Jean T. Ivana and today I will be discussing the key ethical issues, namely the value, obligation, natural law, and virtue. The first key issue to be discussed here is value or the theory of value. The word value is a very familiar term since we are doing this in daily basis. We are being practiced this by giving value or giving worth to something. The value is a basic and fundamental beliefs that gives or motivates our actions. So, value is sometimes defined as the object of human desire and striving. Its technical name is axiology from Greek axios which means worthy and logos which means science. It is also called the theory of value. The theory of value is defined as the philosophical study of goodness or value in the widest sense of these terms. The basic question in axiology is what and why do you value? So basically, the term axiology or the theory of value focuses on the study of the nature of value, the kinds of value as in morals, aesthetics, religion, and etc. In classical Greek, the life lived according to reason is the value or the end in view proper to human striving. The natura naturalist feels that the best possible fulfillment of the individual society is attained through the techniques of the behavioral sciences. The Christian finds value in the good life leading to the union with God, while the existentialist value exists 
in the authenticity of an individual taking his life and his commitments seriously and with the full responsibility. So the naturalist is through the use of the behavioral sciences. The Christian is very religious since it requires a commun communication and building relationship with God. While the existentialist is based on how the person is gonna is seriously com committing and doing the thing with full responsibility. The second one is obligation. Obligation is the claim made upon us by reason that some things are to be done and deserve praise whereas others are to be avoided and deserve blame. So we, we are all have obligations and with that we are we are being experiencing or we have experience to be to be praised or to be blamed. A person has to be praised when he is doing good and right while a person has to be blamed if he has doing wrong and bad. Obligation is clearly related to the notions of responsibility and freedom. Since we are all responsible with our actions when dealing with others and also to ourselves. Deontology is the technical name for the part of ethics that deals with obligation. So, as discussed in the previous slide, the value, the technical name of the value is axiology, while here in obligation, the technical name is deontology. Emmanuel Kant is a philosopher or he is a German philosopher of the Enlightenment stated that the experience fact of duty or responsibility implies that we are free. Kant was a deontologist also in that he placed the intuition of moral obligation at the very center of his ethics. He is very famous with his quote or with his phrase, I ought, therefore I can. The third one or the third ethical issues here is the natural law. Are all standards of right and wrong conditioned solely by the cultural norms by which one lives? If your answer is an affirmative or your if you have an affirmative reply to the statement, you are a cultural relativist who, like the naturalist, view the emergence of novel situations as a perpetual condition of an evolutionary universe and so cannot grant that any standard based on an unchanging human nature can be adequate. So, you cannot grant that that, that standard is and changing human nature and it is inadequate. If you oppose on this statement, you are like the Thomists and Aristotelians that call on a natural law theory that states that man himself is capable of setting up a standard of morality based on his own nature. So if Mapuska, you are basing your own nature. The last one is virtue. Virtue is the power of moral action that enables man to act with peace and order in some area of his life. Some, some of virtues are being discussed in the previous topic. So examples of these virtues are courage, patience, truthfulness, friendliness, and many others. It was being enumerated there. So the Greek sought wisdom in philosophy and prudence and justice in politics. So, so the 
virtue here in philosophy and in politics are being compared. So, in philosophy, it is wisdom, and in politics, its virtue is our prudence and justice. It has been given, given emphasis from classical times to today. The existentialist stresses courage in the face of responsibility. So, uh, in short, or I will be summing up this. So, in philosophy, its virtue is wisdom, and in politics, its virtue are prudence and justice, while for existentialist, it is the courage, in which it is the courage in facing the responsibility. Classical Christian Tradition The first of our five philosophical perspectives is the one with the longest tradition in the Western world. The statement is frequently made that modern civilization is founded on Greek philosophy, Christian theology, Roman law, and modern science. Within Christian philosophy are included the value of Greek philosophy and the profound religious consciousness of Hebrew civilization. In our study of moral philosophy, attention must first be given to the extraordinary and brilliant contributions of the Greeks. Socrates from 470 to 399 BC. He is the one of the originators of a moral system, declared in the apology that the unexamined life is precisely the life not worth living. He sought in an exa examination of the values involved in living the good life to determine some kind of definition for key terms such as the good, the just, and the virtues. The significant value of Socrates' contribution is his confidence in the mind's ability to attain a degree of moral wisdom in the conduct of life. In his view, man could and should bring his reason to bear on the conduct of the good life. Man should also hope to come up with some standards by which to guide himself on the path of his own fulfillment. Plato, from 427 to 347 BC. In his dialogues on the Republic, the Laws, and the Gorgias, also made solid contributions in the formation of our moral consciousness. But the Greek masterpiece of moral inquiry is Aristotle, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, which treats moral problems in terms of the capacities as well as their potentialities of men to do good. Within this work, Aristotle from 384 to 322 BC posited the idea that happiness is the final end of human aspiration and it can be arrived at only by use of reason. Although not all of Greek civilization could be characterized by a strong devotion to reason, the influence of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle was so great that today, we think of the Greeks as having been more concerned with the function of reason, the need for order, and the value of philosophical analysis than almost any other people. The Greek perspective is extended and enriched with the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas from 1225 to 74, who was clearly impressed by the possibility that, that reason could achieve solid and respectable results in the field of morality. Aquinas studied the Greek masters and carefully documented them in his writings. He referred to Aristotle as the philosopher and analyzed his ethics in the long run in the long and splendid commentary on the Nicomachean Ethics. Aquinas lived at the height of the age of faith, but his commitment to faith never diminished his belief in man's power of reason 
and his obligation to use it fully. By his principles that truth is one and whatever is really true in faith and science will never really conflict will never really conflict. He was able to push his own intellectual pursuits to the very limit. Yet Aquinas was no mere echo of the Greek mind. He informed the Greek mind with the Christian commitment and developed areas in which the Greeks were really explicit. For example, the need of self-love. Since God loves all men, it is important that they imitate Him by a pro proper love of themselves. Divine providence is not operative in Aristotle's moral theory, whereas it is a basic assumption for Aquinas. Good day everyone! Today, I'm going to talk about the perspective on the key issues of classical Christian traditions. What is the supreme value in the classical Christian traditions? What do these philosophers see as the object towards which human beings strive and that they desire? So, we are going to answer these questions, these two questions, as we go along with our topic and the deep for more about the key issues of classical Christian traditions. First is value. The Greek and Christian philosophers answer the question of value in two ways. First, they were concerned with finding as a subject that faculty in man that is his highest or most valuable faculty. Faculty, they meant the power of acting in some determined or specific way. The eye, at the mata, is an organ that is this instrument for faculty of seeing. The Greek and most of the Christian philosophers were convinced that the faculty of greatest value in man is his intellect. The power whereby can engage in reasoning, form ideas, or concepts, and make rational judgments. In the second question, the object that will most fulfill the faculty or power of reason and seeking to establish the most valuable power of man is his reason. The Greeks, especially Plato and Aristotle, asked what there is man that be satisfied before he can be they generally agree that man can be properly satisfied only by subject, object, that is proper to his spiritual character. They saw man's special satisfaction to be necessarily a fulfillment of what is special in man. This they thought to be mind or soul, which represents to them what is best in man. So, a man cannot be fully satisfied if his spiritual character is not satisfied. Therefore, man's spiritual striving must be satisfied before man is satisfied. Most of the philosophers in this tradition saw the presence of intellect, the power to understand the world and to express that understanding in ideas and sentence. As to appetite or human tendency, that is the prime area for human satisfaction, fulfillment, or happiness. Moving on, John Stuart Mill, a utilitarian philosopher of the 19th century who stated that it would be better to be a sad Socrates than to be a satisfied pig. Man as a subject simply could not be satisfied without taking into account the perfection of his reason and his power of free of choice. To be a man, not exercise responsibility or seek the values of the examined and reasonable life would be to live without exercising one's highest and most distinctive power. The satisfied be aware of his own satisfaction or be able to reflect and enjoy it consciously. So for John Stuart Mill, it would be better to be a sad Socrates because he can e exercise his responsibility or seek values of the examined and reasonable life than to be a pig that is not aware of his own satisfaction or be able to reflect and enjoy it. So, mas maayong pa daw mahimong sad Socrates than to be a satisfied pig. Next is closely related to this intellect is the will. 
whereby one actively desires the good that one has come to know as the result of the ability of the intellect. Man is ordered to the possession of true and good. The Christian concurred with the Greeks in insisting that man cannot be satisfied unless his highest seeking, that of his intellect and will, is satisfied. So for Christians and concords with Greeks that highest seeking of man, which is intellect and will, must be satisfied first before the man can be satisfied. Thus, a rational character appears in these ethics of traditions. As the Greek and Christian viewed the world and man, they classified in hierarchical manner. For them, the lowest beings in the world of sense experience consist of minerals or in their terms, the four primary elements, which are earth, air, fire, and water. These elements lack, among other things, that is essential, quality of life, a quality of perfection which plants possess. A being with life is considered more perfect than one without it because of its power of reproduction of its kind and growth from a germal to a mature state and its ability to engage in nutrition, to master the mineral elements, and to observe them into its own identity. So plant can do that. Meanwhile, those four primary elements cannot. But even though the plant is considered more perfect than the stone or the primary elements, it lacks the perfection of life possessed by a sentient animal, which has greater ability to live because of its power of locomotion, imagination, instinct, and organic sensation. When the Greeks and Christian viewed man, they saw him as if possessing the power of abstract reasoning. So a man is right, possessed of power of abstract reasoning, whereby he is able to master technique and gain knowledge that will produce the arts of arts and sciences, which a plants of other animals cannot. A man right, diba? this power of reasoning is higher in kind than any possessed by stone, plant, or animal, it is the distinguishable character and essential quality of man. In Plato, this immutability, this ethereal character and permanence is seen in the ethereal ideas of justice, truth, goodness, and beauty, though it would be incorrect to think of Plato as naive that this idea share a kind of spatio-temporal existence in the world. The realm is spiritual in character. Man reaches his highest value when he is able by act or direct intuition to see what truth and justice and beauty are in himself. These steps by which this insight into beauty itself is attained to describe by Socrates in the Symposium. For Aristotle thought, man's fulfillment is gained by contemplation, but Aristotle did not specify any kind, any object that will itself be the perfect object of contemplation. The next key issues in classical Christian tradition is obligation. Reason is emphasized ganina sa values, di ba? By the use of it, man sees himself obligated to do certain things, like to pay back his debts. Um, a teacher is obligated to teach his or her students, to deal fairly with friends, obligation, or possession of duties. It is a moral demand imposed by man's reason in assessing his own life situation. Reason itself does not create demand. So, ang reason, di naman siya dyan makakreate ng demand. But rather, by a reason, man is able to recognize what is due to others and to himself. So, by a reason, ang mga tao, makarecognize sila what is due sa ubang tao o sa atong kaugalingon. Obligation, as described in the readings that follow, treat of rights and duties. So, obligation is the treats of rights and duties. 
A right is a moral power that imposes obligation on another to respect it. Thus, every man who has basic needs for food and survival has a claim on the recognition by others and his needs. Relative to the knowledge of obligation is the fact of freedom of choice. One cannot be blamed for doing what he could not avoid under any circumstances. Likewise, one cannot claim praise for what has done automatically and without freedom of any kind. This condition of freedom in the face of obligation is essential ingredient in the classical and Christian tradition. So, freedom, condition of freedom in the face of obligation is the essential ingredient in the classical Christian tradition. It is not enough that one should act in a specific way. One has to decide whether to follow his reason. The reason may command choice of the reasonable deed does not necessarily follow. The classical Christian tradition also emphasizes the spiritual and interior quality of free ascent. Socrates affirmed in the Pedo that his limbs, young limbs, if left to themselves, would carry him fast from his prison. But because of the principle, he was able to make inner spiritual free commitment to stay there. In this description of obligation, Aquinas restated in the Christian context much of what was central to the tradition of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. For him, the ultimate source of obligation is the eternal law now. For Ania, ang ultimate source of obligation is the eternal law, the divine plan for all creation that proceeds from God. But God chooses to make man such that can, by the use of his reason, come to the recognition of his obligation in life. In the structure of moral act, Aquinas saw another sign of the close way in which the human creature is able to participate in the plan of God. In morality, man participates in the eternal law of God by operating his moral life according to reason. Man is not a passive recipient by ready-made laws. So man is not a passive recipient of ready-made laws, but he brings himself to know the law and to formulate it by the power of reason. So, ang man makasabot siya sa law, makaformulate siya sa law because of the power of reason nga naasa man or sa tao. So, I will be discussing the continuation on the perspective and the key issues. Natural law. Aristotle and Aquinas had confidence that man could discover some objective, universal, and necessary laws of morality. Aristotle and Aquinas considered law as an ordering of some kind of whereby the pattern of activities of a being reaches its perfection. They were convinced that the beings below man, such as animals, plants, and minerals, are directed to their perfection or proper final way of existing by a principle basic to them or their substantial form. Thus, they thought of the primary elements as having certain tendencies because of their form. Air tended to be dry and light, earth tended to be dry and heavy, fire tended to be hot and dry, and water tended to be cold and wet. The primary elements act as they do because of the nature they possess. For men, the presence of freedom as a result of reason makes the natural law not an external impose necessity. Rather, man becomes aware of his nature and the activities proper to him by his autonomous act of reason. Natural law theme in this tradition is closely related to the notion of a standard or a norm of morality. Granted that man is to discover
discover the pattern of his morality with the use of his reason. The question remains whether any model or standard exists against which man may rationally measure his action. Man's nature is considered dependent and contingent on God, who is constantly conserving man in being and is in itself the fulfillment of man's striving. The actions of man should reflect reverence toward God as the author and reserver of life. For as the first general principle of reverence toward God is found by measuring man's nature in terms of its source and end, the second principle can be found by comparing man to his fellow man. Each man is seen as capable of realizing that all human beings have the same essential needs. An individual should respect in other people the same basic needs that he has in himself. Next is virtue. Virtue in the Greek or Christian sense consists of qualities of excellence whereby man is rendered more perfect as man. The qualities of excellence enable man to act with ease and order in a given area of human existence. The cardinal virtues which is courage, temperance, justice, and prudence are involved in the reasonable decision made in the standard human situations. For example, the man of courage faces danger when it is reasonable to do so. He represents the mean which Aristotle declared to be between the extremes of recklessness and cowardice. The reckless man does things because he is unaware of the unreasonableness of expressing himself to unnecessary dangers. The coward refuses to face danger when reason considers such a confrontation necessary. It is noteworthy that the virtue of courage does not imply, for Aristotle, the lack of fear in the presence of danger. It is the vice of the reckless man that he is not aware of all the fear that he should have. So the virtue of courage depends on the reasonableness of facing or avoiding danger. reasonable control over the desires of the body. Justice Justice is the reasonable of what is due to others. And lastly, prudence. Prudence is reasonableness in decision. And that's the end of our discussion about classical Christian tradition.